have been doing a series all month long. I've been talking about the gifts of God. And um, if you and give me my PowerPoint up here, uh, I've been talking about the fact that we give gifts at Christmas, but God's giving gifts too. And we talked about the joy that God gives you can't buy at the store, the peace that God gives you can't buy at the store, talked about hope. And uh, today uh, I was going to be talking about faith over fear. Now, I remember preaching a message by that title when this pandemic began and uh, thought we'll wrap it up. Well, Christmas Eve, when my dad was just spontaneously flowing out with what God was speaking to him, some of you are here, you know, he started preaching my message. So I said, Dad, are you ready to preach that message? I knew he needed more time on a Sunday morning, and he said he was. So I'm pleased that he's going to bring a word to us today about the Christ in you. When you've got God in you, there's no room for fear. The Bible says perfect love, God is love, casts out all fear. For some of you that don't know my father uh, as well as I do, I've known him for 67 years. You know, um, God's used my dad in such a powerful way to bring the message of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the gifts of the Spirit, uh, back when many people in churches were not understanding that. And uh, there's been a fire of the power of God moving through this ministry uh, this whole time because of the way my dad's been yielded to God, a pioneer in so many respects, but carrying the gospel of the kingdom and the message of the gifts of the Spirit. Help me welcome my dad and our founder, Dr. Gerald Durstein. your microphone. I don't know what that is. Scary looking. Frightening. Anyway, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I really want to thank Pastor Phil and his wife and the church for allowing me to speak to you. Well, some of you don't know that I'm already past 90. I must be about the oldest speaker that ever spoke up here in this podium. I'm 92, actually. I'm going on 93 now. I'm going on 100, to be honest with you. I'm just going to keep on going, in other words. But anyway, uh, congratulations, Phil and Jeanette, on your 45th anniversary. Wonderful. Keep it going. It'll keep getting better. But this morning, I am excited. Maybe not as excited as I was preparing the message. But when I'm preparing a message, it's on my mind for days before I speak it. And I get awake at night, 2 o'clock in the morning. I have a special chair in my bedroom that I like to sit on. And when I'm on that chair, all kinds of thoughts come to me from God's Word, from the Bible. And uh, I get to understand things I never understood before. But I want to share something today that has to do with a mystery. And I, I'd like to let you know it's going to be, I'm going to do my best to unveil a mystery that the Bible calls a mystery. And all of us, we kind of like mystery stories, and you read about mystery quite often in the Bible. Before I get, get into that, let me say some other word. Pastor Phil mentioned to me the other day that he said the rumor in this church that I said some time ago that I, or, or that he stole this church from me way back years ago. <laughs> and that's so far from the truth. It's not true at all. But I try to remember what caused that kind of rumor to get out, and I kind of remember what it was. It was at the time when I saw fit from the call of God to call on Pastor Phil, my son, to be the pastor and to be the president of this organization and the head of this organization. Amen. And there were some people that didn't agree with that. In fact, there was quite a few people that thought that was terrible. For number one, he was too young. Number two, he wasn't, he wasn't prepared for that. He, he, didn't, he didn't have that kind of a calling. And all kinds of stories were out at that time. And I can't help but think, I guess some of that stuff is still rolling around at times. But anyway, I'm going to let you know it's not the truth at all. 
that I'm not, he never did steal this church from me. In fact, it's never been my church. It's been one to God from the beginning. <laughs> but in your Bible, in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, here's a very interesting Bible verse. Since I was 23 years old, that's when I was first ordained to be a pastor of a church. And I was a Mennonite at that time. I was a good Mennonite at that time. I was influenced by my uncle, Llewellyn Groff. He was a brother to my mother. And um, I was helping him in a missionary work amongst the Indian people in northern Minnesota. And I was ordained in the month of July in, when I was 23 years old, I forget which, I think it was 19, I forget what year it was, that's not important. But anyway, when I hear him preach, he often liked to quote this verse. Colossians 1.27, and he was a very unusual man. He was a big man, and uh, I worked with him a whole lot, and he was, not, he, was not, he was not very emotional. He could stand in front of people and just talk, and he, in, in a way, it's kind of boring, except for the fact that if you watch his face, he could talk and smile, and, and he quoted this verse, and this verse affected me from way back since I'm 23 years of age. I'm 92 now. But let me read the verse to, to you. It's Colossians 1.27. It says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And he would stop there after he read, and he'd just smile at the people. And, when, and I used to wonder, why don't you explain that to us? He didn't know how to explain it, but he liked the feel of it. It made me feel good, too. <laughs> you, you heard of glory, haven't you? You ever hear of glory land? We were always, we always were, in, were impressed to believe that glory is where heaven is located. And it certainly was not going to be here. It's got to be on some other planet that's up there in the universe somewhere floating around. And someday we're going to leave here and we're going to go to heaven and be in the glory of God. You know, that's where the mansions are located, where the big stacks of gold and silver and diamonds are big warehouses up there. God preparing all that stuff for us when we die and go to heaven. But we were always influenced to believe that. And we'd sing songs about, Oh, won't it be wonderful there, just over in the glory land. Da -da -da, da -da 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 -da. We don't sing that anymore, but they used to sing that years ago. Over in the glory land. We could hardly wait uh, to get the glory land. But here, I found this verse where God began to show to me, it's really not that way. We got to stop thinking that we got to get out of here and go somewhere else to find God's glory. Because honestly, God's glory is not on another planet. God's glory would be where He might be located. And I found a, I found another scripture verse in the Book of Romans, chapter nine and verse twenty-three, almost says the same thing. Here in Romans chapter 9, verse 23 says, And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. Now, who are the vessels of mercy? Well, God showed humans, we people, are recipients of God's mercy. So we're vessels of mercy. So that he might make known, he, God wants to make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had before prepared unto glory. So God has in mind for his glory to become known. I believe where people are located. And I found other scriptures. I, I used to teach on this in the IOM school. I spent a few hours on this, a few days, an understanding of the glory of God. And I found these scriptures in the Old Testament, in the Bible, in the book of Numbers 1421, and we sing this verse, but as truly as I live, all the earth, how many believe you're living on the earth, right? Now, we're not living on some other planet, we're living on planet earth. 
But as true as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Now, that verse impresses me. If that's what, the, what God's word says, that means God really has in mind for people on the earth to have an understanding of the glory of the Lord. And I want to try to give that understanding to you this morning. In the book of Habakkuk, another prophet, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 14 says, For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the, the sea. So God really has in mind for his glory to be observed, to be experienced perhaps, to be known about on the earth where we dwell. How is he going to make that happen? And Isaiah, the prophet, he spoke these words in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 5, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. There's a little clue there now. Hmm. It's going to be on the earth. We already agree it's going to be on the earth. That's where we live. And the glory of the Lord, Isaiah said, shall be revealed, and all flesh, and I'm made of flesh, you're made of flesh, and all flesh shall see it. So apparently, glory is something you can see. You can take a step further. It's, it's something you can experience, the glory of the Lord. What is the glory of the Lord? That he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. That's people. He wants to make known the riches of God's glory on people, which he had prepared unto glory. Wow. You know, if that's true... Maybe heaven is not on some other planet called planet heaven. Are you all still with me on this? I'm, not, I'm going somewhere. <laughs> so I'm not going to take you too far. Just enjoy your seat where you are. And keep listening carefully. Because this is a revelation. It's a revelation that will change your way of living forever. You don't have to be hoping for a better day when all of a sudden God will reveal to you that you're living in that day. You already are there. And I want to prove that to you. In the book of Psalms, another verse, King David, he said these words, Psalm 72, verse 19, and blessed be his glorious name forever and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. So I'm convinced that God wants his glory to be made known on the earth where people dwell. That's where we dwell. Where people that live in Florida, people that live in Georgia, people that live in Minnesota, Pennsylvania, wherever they come from, can understand in a measure the glory of God. Just to think, what if his glory has been here all these days, all these years, and we've been hoping that we get there someday after we physically die and go to glory? Go to Gloria Land. Anyway, thank you, Jesus. Isn't that interesting? I could stop right here, and that'd be worth it all already. <laughs> I'm not going to stop there yet. Here's the scripture in Psalms 84 and verse 11. It says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory no good thing. So apparently, glory is a good thing for people. Amen. Remember, years ago, I said, people are the problem in the world. And God is emphasizing that he's going to do something for people. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Okay, that's good. I like that. That's Psalm 84, verse 11. They're glory promises. Promises of God's glory. Then we have a scripture in 1 Peter 1, 7, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perisheth, though it be tried by fire. I want to show you something here that God puts a, a big emphasis on the... Uh, word faith. There's something about faith that's a key 
to coming into glory while you pay taxes in Florida. I mean, we're in Florida. I'm talking from the state of Florida right now. And we're in Florida. And I'm going to try to show to you that there's a mystery that God wants you to understand that while you're in Florida, you don't have to wait for a future day if you understand correctly and know how to, what to do, you can come into literally the glory of God right here. I used to wonder, what is the glory of God? But I found scripture sometime back in the book of Exodus. It was actually, did you ever hear of Moses? Moses was a very interesting man. He loved God. And he's a man that God chose to give the Ten Commandments to on Mount Sinai. And he had spent quite a bit of time talking with God before the time of Jesus. He wasn't even a Christian, but he was a man that loved God. Moses I'm talking about right now. And he was talking with God for several days up on that mountain. All by was not eating food, fasting, and meditating, conversing with God. And one day he's in chapter number 33, and he said to God, I beseech you, God, would you show me your glory? I mean, that's a good question. Moses was feeling something more than just having a conversation with something. There was something that he was feeling good about. And I guess the best word he could think of was glory. Whoa, glory, glory to God. Hallelujah, glory. Did you ever hear that word glory? Doesn't it make you feel good when you say glory? So Moses had a lot of nerve. You know, when you talk to somebody long enough, you get kind of more bold toward them. You get to know them real well, you can ask them some very intimate questions. So Moses asked an intimate question with God. He says, God, we've been talking together, having a good time together up here on this mountain. Do you mind showing me your glory? Well, God was a friend of Moses, and so God spoke in the next verse, is I'm going to make my goodness pass before you. That's what God said to Moses. Goodness? Do you ever hear of that word goodness? G-O-O-D-N-E-S-S. -S. Goodness. I discovered that's one of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, goodness, meekness, temperance, gentleness, one of the virtues of the fruit of the Spirit. So goodness is in God. We've always believed that if you have God in your life, it's going to make you good. If you're not sure, your neighbor knows that. If you go to church, they expect you to be a good person. And many times your neighbors observe you getting in your automobile on a Sunday and you're on your way to church. But they don't go to church, but they know you're a good person because you go to church. And you believe you are good too because you believe in God. You spell God, capital G-O-D. You spell good, G-O-O-D. Goodness, so good is in God, you knew that. And so you know that you're good thanks to God. So the goodness is in God. And now I'm discovering goodness must be part of God's glory. Is that okay with you? Goodness is part of God's glory. And if goodness is in God, and you can seek God in Florida and find him, and you can invite him to come into your heart. And you can allow him to abide there. If you believe that, then you know that the goodness of God, that part of his glory is dwelling in you now. If you're not too sure you're that good, at least you should thank God that he, he decided to bring his goodness inside of you. <laughs> That's right. I mean, just because you're in Florida doesn't mean that God is happy about you coming to a warmer climate. No, no, God chose you before you even came to Florida. If you're from up north somewhere, like I was up in Minnesota where it gets cold. Uh, but God comes into your heart because he chose to inhabit people. Because people were the problem on the earth, primarily, not trees. People were the problem, not birds. People were the problem, not fish, not animals. But God chose to come inside of people. He came from heaven to earth to show us the way. 
to think that God chose to become a human for a while. And he would live like a, uh, like a human. And he did. And he had a name. His name was Jesus. And everywhere he went, he was known as Jesus the Christ. Jesus the Christ. And I remember Jesus, many times he was complimented by people. You're such an unusual man, Jesus. Where do you get all this wisdom from? Where do you get all this authority, this power? You're so different. He said, I get it from my father. Then uh, they would say, your father? Who is your father? Where is your father? And he said, when you see me, you see my father. And it finally dawned on me one day in my meditation. You know when you get to up in years, I'm 92 now, you got more time to sit and meditate and read the word and not be in a hurry because you're not going anywhere, you're already there. <laughs> That's right. I stay busy doing nothing. <laughs> and I enjoy it. When I was a lot younger, I wouldn't enjoy that at all. But when you sit there and you do nothing and you're thinking and you look into the air and you see all kinds of stuff in the air and you realize that air is pretty much like God. Really? Air and God are kind of synonymous? Well, you read that in the Bible anyhow. He said, the wind blows wherever it wants to go. It comes from wherever it comes from. And he said, so are those people who are born of the Spirit. Oh, that makes sense. I was born of the Spirit. I got born again. And the Spirit of God came into me. So whatever came into me must be pretty much like the wind. Are you all still listening? I won't blow too hard on you here, but... Anyway, I, I, I enjoy just sitting there watching the wind. And I see all kinds of stuff in that wind because I discovered that air is in the wind. In fact, air is everywhere you go. Air has been there before you get there. And God is kind of that way. God is, what the Bible says, omnipresent. He's everywhere present. You can't escape God. God's already there where you're going. He's there before you get there. He's, he's, he's with you while you're going there. And he stays behind where you came from. He's always, he's everywhere. He's everywhere. He's an omnipotent God, an almighty God. And he's, he's everywhere. And uh, this is the part that Jesus said was guiding him and doing all these works. Then it dawned on me that must have been the Christ part of Jesus. I mean, Jesus didn't come from a man and woman whose last name was Christ. He came from Joseph and Mary, we know that, but their last name was not Christ. But he's always known as Jesus the Christ, Jesus Christ. I studied the word Christ and discovered the word Christ actually means anointing or a greater measure of all the good that was in Jesus. It actually means another way you're going to interpret it by saying it's actually the presence of God the Father, Amen. Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Father, Jesus the God. Jesus is the God of the universe. Yes. Jesus the Christ. And now I hear this scripture that we read this morning to you, and it's a mystery. It's God's going to unveil that mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Well, if I believe that Christ is the Father part of Jesus, that, that the Father God was with Jesus all the time, may we believe while we're in Florida that the Father God can come inside of us and stay inside of us wherever we go. Do you ever say, thank you, Father? Yep. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Yes. Father God is in us. Well, we're getting somewhere. I'm still going. I'm not quite there yet, but I'm still going. Stay with me. Anyway, I think that's very interesting. And so in Philippians 4.19, it says, But my God shall supply all of your need, your personal need, according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You know, once Christ comes into your life, you have the potential of doing the supernatural. You actually have the potential of becoming godly. Oh, no, that's pretty much. 
That's almost too much, isn't it? I mean, not when we pay taxes. You can't be godly where you've got to pay taxes. Uh, but it seems like the scripture indicates that when Jesus comes into you, God comes into you, and if God comes into you, you can become better acquainted with him, and perhaps you can become more godly, maybe even more godlike. Well, what's God like? Well, the Bible says God is love. Can you say the word love? L-O-V-E. God is love. Love is a spiritual thing. You can't see love, but you can experience it. You can't look at it and you can't say love is round, love is square, love is the shape of a heart, kind of. Uh, love, love is God. God is love. And so if I have God, I also have love. So if I have Christ, I have the love of God. And let me explain something to you. If I tell you that the love of God is in you, if you have Christ in you, would I be correct saying that? I, I'm correct saying that, right? But many of us, we're not sure that we really have the love of God in us all the time. Because sometimes we do things that doesn't appear like the love of God had anything to do with it. And we're kind of embarrassed, we're ashamed, we're guilty, we feel bad about it. We ask God to forgive us and we never do it again. But does God stay with us? Did he ever tell us anywhere, I will never leave you, I'll never forsake you? He said, lo, I am with you. Even when you're high, he's with you. When you're low, he's with you. Uh, lo, I'm with you always, and always I'm with you. And let me, let me help you. For you to have that love grow and increase in you, you need to confess it. You need to lay claim to it. And I'm trying to tell you that if you have God, you can't have God without his love. That's what he is. Are you still listening? I mean, that's what he is. That's part of the Christ that's in you. You don't mind being called a, Christ, a Christian, do you? You're a Christian. You're a human with Christ in you. If you have Christ in you, you have the goodness of God in you. If you have Christ in you, you have the love of God in you. If you have Christ in you, you have the peace of God in you. I mean, now you have it. You don't have to wait till you die and go in a grave and you'll fly away someday. You're not going to fly away. Stay here. <laughs> Hallelujah. That makes me feel good. This idea of flying away. They think, I'll fly away, oh, glory. I used to always wonder, where are you going? And they all seem to, they seem to give the idea they want to go to meet God. He's surely not here. They're going to fly away when they get out of here, and they're going to be with God then. What if I tell you that God already came from there to here? Amen. What if his name was Jesus? Yes. And what if he chose to make your body his temple? I mean, what do you think about that? Can you believe that much? That's kind of getting far out. And what if a bunch of temples get together and, and God calls this his house? He already has a temple. Not made with man's hands. God is building a house. God is building a house. God is building a house that will stand. He is building by his plan with the lively stones of man. God is building your, that's all heaven to his house that will stand. You are, honestly, honestly, from God's view, from God's word, you are the house of God now. Now, if you really be, you've got to start believing this and quit acting like a, like a church-going person. <laughs> I mean, quit acting like, like you, you can be good on a Sunday. But honestly, you are the temple of God. You are the house of God. You are the body of Christ. Christ has a body in this world, but it's spiritual. It's not physical. But your physical bodies, because of your faith, you have faith in the Spirit. Your spirit was trans-quickened by the Spirit of Jesus when you became born again. Now you're in the kingdom of God. Quit thinking you're going to physically die first and go to some other location. 
I know this is kind of rare. It's kind of odd talk. But I'm going to give the truth. I'm 92, and I can say this now. People can say, Brother Dershowitz kind of far out. But he's been around for a lot, a lot of years already, too. But I'm declaring that to you because I honestly believe that. I believe that the Spirit of God is in people. And I believe that he looks at our being, a physical being, as his temple. And we can actually enthrone him in our lives. And we can make him a king to us. We can make him a lord to us. And we can enthrone him in his temple. That's where the throne of God is. The throne of a king is usually in his temple. But you hold the key to enthrone him. And, and let me come a little closer to you. Uh, you enthrone him when you acknowledge what he is. Now, I know you're hearing about it this morning, but from now on, it's going to be up to you if, you're going to, if it's going to be real to you. You have to lay claim to it with your confession. Can you say the word confession? You confess with your mouth. You talk through your mouth. You say, thank you, Jesus, for your love. Thank you, Father God, for your goodness. Thank you, Father God, for your peace. Thank you, Father God, for your patience. If you're kind of weak in some of those areas, especially say that many times during a day, when you're not saying anything else to other people, just talk to God and say, I always say, thank you, Father. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your meekness. Thank you for your temperance. All those virtues, all those virtues are the character of God. The fruit of the Spirit are the character. And if you confess it with your mouth, don't wait till you believe you have them. But the Bible says you do have them if you have Jesus. If you have Christ, that's what you got. Come on. You didn't just get a religion, get a membership into somebody's church building. No, no, you become related to the Father God, the creator of the universe. Yes. And now he wants the people of the rest of the world to find him. And he knows if, if people will believe the truth, they will have no problem finding God when they meet you. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. well, that sounded good to me. To think that I'm the carrier of God? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Think of all these years, 92 years I've been living. Actually, after 92 years, at least uh, 72 years of those years, I've been a born-again believer in Jesus. And I've been hoping that the glory of God would be manifest in my life. And whenever I find myself being impatient, unpleasant or whatever, I ask God to help me to overcome that, and I thank him for what he says he is, because right. he's living in me too, so even though I am what I physically discover I was, I can become what he is. He never changes. I change by circumstances around me, but, but I don't have to remain that way if I keep confessing correctly. And when you get real old like I am, I'm not that old, I just look that way. <laughs> By the way, don't take a picture of me when I'm preaching up there. Right? You can see me on Facebook. I look like an old man when I watch me on Facebook. Says, who's that guy? It has my name under it. <laughs> I don't feel like I look, honestly, I don't. I feel a lot younger than what I look. Because it's what I believe. It's what I believe. Christ is in me, the hope of God's glory. And I, now I'm understanding what his glory is. His glory is all the fruit of the Spirit. I tell you what helped me understand that. One day some years ago, I asked God, would you show me what Jesus Christ is? Because our churches have always taught us who he is, and they've always taught us where he's located. But they never taught us what he is. Are you all still listening? Yes. Yeah. I'm still going somewhere. <laughs> Every once in a while I hit that location, but I'm going back in, from a different angle. There's another angle. And so the Lord let me understand that a human is who they are. See, I'm a who. 
Everybody know, knows me about Mr. Durstein. He's a preacher, he's a pastor, been a minister, evangelist, he's traveled a lot, done all this stuff, did, build, did buildings. That's who he is. But God showed me that I was a what before I became a who. And that made sense to me when he started to explain that to me because he made me understand that every human is a what. When you're first born, you are a human. When you're first born, people can't say if you're going to be a good person or a bad person right away because you're just a human, a baby human, a baby child. That's what you are. You're a human being. But every human being is born with a character, number one. Number two, they're born with a certain ability because you, are, you, you, have, a, you have been born with the DNA of your parents. Every person has a DNA, and in that DNA, there's, uh, there's certain, a, a certain ability that's going to be revealed in their lifetime. So I have a DNA of my father, which was a Durstein, and so I have the DNA of a Durstein in me, thanks to my father. And so not only did that, was I born with a character, which was not very good. I mean, my father was German, and he was kind of a bad, uh, a bad temper. And so it was easy for, for me to copy him. It would come out easy, especially if my older brother would not treat me right. I'd get mad real fast. he throws throw something at me, I'd pick it right back and throw it right back at him again. It was easy to do that. Nobody had to teach me that. I just, that just came ordinary. And that was part of my character at that time. <laughs> but then I found out later that a person can become born again. Actually, born again. Born from heaven. Born from God. And when you're born from God, another character comes in. Another DNA comes into you. Literally, God comes into you when you get born again. Can you hear me? God comes into you. The Christ part of Jesus becomes a part of you, and now you're a Christian. You're a Christian because you became born again. Okay, I'll try to get back up here again. I'm a short guy. By the way, I'm not getting any taller either the longer I live. <laughs> I was quite disappointed when they measured me a few weeks back when I went to a doctor's office. And they said only five foot two. I said, that's not right. I used to be five foot five and a half. <laughs> who, pushed, who pushed me down? <laughs> then there was on a scale, I'm lighter weight too. I'm not as heavy as I used to be. Hey, that's kind of a good part anyway. <laughs> anyway, I thought that was kind of interesting. Five foot two. I'm still going. Hallelujah. I like that. Now, let me give you that scripture about the, 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 the lively stones in 1 Peter 2, 5. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Now that I know Jesus Christ is in me, Jesus the Christ, the Christ is in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Now, I, want to, I, I was always looking forward to going to heaven where there's going to be just joy there, there's going to be love there, there's going to be peace there, there's going to be happiness there. Now I'm beginning to discover that that's all in Christ. That's all in Jesus. I mean, the love of God is in Christ. The peace of God is in Jesus Christ. The joy of the Lord is in Jesus Christ. The meekness of God, the temperance of God, the goodness of God, the faith of God. All those fruit of the Spirit are in Jesus Christ. And now that I invited him into my heart, that's all in me now. Hallelujah. And that's all part of God's glory. And that's what God wants to show the world. They can't see God, but they can see, the world can see people. And if people believe that God is in them, and we are, we're people like that, we believe that God is in us. And so we should know that when people are meeting us, they're going to bump into the love of God. 
I'm, 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 I'm revealing, I'm unmasking a mystery. Are you getting it? For young people, older people, no matter what your age, it'll work. But it demands your confession, though. It demands your confession. You have a lot of time being alone when you're alone in your automobile, going to town. Just speak it with your mouth. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. Thank you for your faith. Because you, sometimes you think your faith is very little, or very low. But you increase in faith when you thank the Father for the faith that he gave you. And thank him for giving you more faith. Thank you for the healing, the good health he's given you, even though you don't feel good health, even if you feel like you're half sick. Thank him for, that he's given you healing. And by his stripes, you were healed. You are healed by his stripes. By your confession, you keep overcoming all your natural negative maladies in your, in your body, in your life, in your mind, in your com community. And you can live in the glory realm of God. And if you believe that and you start doing it, you're going to feel you're already in heaven. You won't be anxious to die anymore. You won't be anxious to fly, or fly away. You're going to finally understand what you're doing here. You're causing God's kingdom to come. And you're causing God's will to be done on earth, in earth, as it is in heaven. So heaven is where God is located. And God's not necessarily up there. Remember I, some time ago I told you up is not that direction from God's point of view. Up is that area that's beyond you, where your extremity is where God's possibilities begin. The miraculous is in, in the hands of God. God is a miracle worker. We sang about that this morning. So that's very good. And in, in Isaiah 60, verses 1 and 2, Pastor Phil often used these verses. I, I enjoy Pastor Phil's preaching lately. He's really, he's really getting it. <laughs> he, he's a young man to be getting it already that early. You know, the way to his 92. Isaiah 60, verses 1 and 2 says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. So I'm trying to make you understand that the glory of God is rising upon you, in you, through you, but you need to agree with it. I mean, you've got to believe it. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So if you do anything by faith, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. But if you want to just stay here and be miserable until you physically die and hope you'll get to go to heaven someday, you'll stay the way you are. You won't change any. But if you start believing that the presence of God is what his glory is, and his glory is resident in you, and God wants you to be grateful and thankful that his glory is resident in his temple, and you are his temple. And, con and corporately, we are his house. We are the house of God. We are the people of God in the world today. We are the people that God knows can cause his glory to be seen over all the earth as the waters cover the sea. There's billions of people on this earth, and if they all become born again and are begin to be taught that God dwells in them and, the, and that God, where God is is where his glory is, I know some preachers say God does not share his glory with man, but he does. That's God's plan. He wants his glory to be seen upon the earth through people, God's people, the church. I'm just about finished here now. I got another couple of verses here I want to give to you. When Christ, who is our life, I like this here in Colossians 3, 4, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. And this is what happens to me lately quite a bit. I mean, when I'm meditating all by myself, even at 2 o'clock in the morning on my chair in my bedroom before I go back to bed again the second or third time, depends how many times I've got to go potty in the morning. <laughs> but i got a nice chair that's made just specially for me to sit on, and that's when I got a lot of revelation at that time. <laughs> oh, my, it's so good. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, you know how he appears to you? 
when any of his glories become manifest. And I remember just the other night, I was so happy, I was laughing. I was laughing in that chair, but I had to keep my shut. I could, surely was still sleeping in bed. I was not in bed, I was on my chair. And I just laughing inside, I could hardly hold it back. I felt so good because Christ appeared to me. I mean, Christ is not just a physical man with gray hair and blue eyes or brown eyes. Not the kind of Christ I believe in. Christ is God. And Christ is a spirit. And I'm not looking for another man to come and shake my hand. Here I am. No, I already found him as my father. And he dwells with me always. Uh, he never leaves me. I'm always, I always have company no matter where I go. And there's always a hallelujah right on the tip of my tongue. Or there's a speaking in tongue. Right, right, right on the edge of my tongue all the time. There's just something happy inside of me all the time. It just wants to, it comes out. It's the glory of God. And that's in all of us. But we have to understand what it is. I'm, I'm unveiling a mystery to you. I'm telling you that's in you now. But you have to acknowledge it with your mouth, with your confession, with your talk. Are you willing to do that? 2021, no matter what happens to our country, no matter what's going on in the world, and uh, all kinds of things will happen. When the enemy comes to destroy you or hurt you, and all you can do is start getting happy or start speaking in tongues, just do it. And they're, have, they're going to have an encounter with God, not just you. They don't know God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. So I'm about to tell you that when you get real happy and, and, and you feel so good inside, that's Christ appearing with you in glory. That's what his glory is. His glory is joy. His glory is peace. His glory is contentment. His glory is fulfillment. You don't have to look for fun anymore. Remember when you were, when you were a baby Christian, you wanted to have fun? Fun is too cheap. Once you find the glory, you don't look for fun anymore. The fun doesn't cut it. Fun's only skin deep. Uh, but glory gets down into your, into your bosom, into your gizzard. Down in, <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. That's fulfillment. But if you're just looking for fun, you're just selling yourself cheap. Go all the way. Go where the, where the glory is. Just over in the glory land. Amen. Glory promises. I got to bring this to an end here. I'm having a good time up here. I, I think you can tell by now that I am. But I'm trying to be calm. But let, let me finish with this. In John 14, in verse 1, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Then Jesus said, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And when I read that one time, I read the verses ahead of that, and it was Peter that was with Jesus. Jesus, you're telling us you're going somewhere. Jesus said, yes, I am going somewhere. Where I'm going, you can't go with me now, but you shall follow me later. And then I found this verse. Jesus said, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. And I discovered that in God's house, it's not a big building with a lot of bedrooms and bathrooms. I used to think it was up in heaven, uh, when I believed that heaven was a planet, there were a lot of great big mansions up there, big cathedrals, big buildings, and some people are going to have a bigger building than other people, they're going to have more bedrooms, more bathrooms, but they've got to have maids, they're going to have all kinds of people, all kinds of cleaning material to keep it clean, when there's not going to be any dust there, no, no, you don't have to keep it clean, and you don't, you don't have to have any beds in your bedrooms, you just got a, a blank bedroom, but you, but you do want a bunch of bedrooms there, don't you? You don't want just one, but you only have one bedroom here all your life. You only want to have at least five or ten of them up there. No, no, you want any bed because you don't have no bed. You're not going to be no night there to go to sleep. You'll be awake all the time. But anyway, um, 
In my father's house are many, the word mansions should be interpreted dwelling places, dwelling places. Now I understand that my heart is one of those mansions because I have welcomed Jesus into my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, come in today. Come in to stay. I welcome to stay in my heart. That's a dwelling place for Jesus. And now that I know he's there, he's making me aware of what he's made of. He's like his father. He has the love of his father. He has the peace of his father, the joy of the father, the goodness of the father. All the fruit of the spirit are in me where he dwells. That's one of his mansions. You're one of his mansions too. Every one of you as a human are one of the dwelling places of Jesus. In the Father, you're the Father's house. You are the house of God, made up of lively stones, people. Are you all getting? I'm giving you a whole lot of stuff this morning. You don't have to try to. You don't have to try to believe it all at once. Just believe a little bit at a time. Just catch at least one little thing and hang on to it. And you'll get some more of it later on. Pastor Phil will give you some more. <laughs> What do you think people will think of you if you start acting as though you're already in heaven? I mean, you're walking with a smile on your face all the time, and people try to irritate you, and you can't get mad. All you can do is say, well, God bless you. You good for nothing. Well, you're not the first one that told me that. I knew that before you even knew it. That's why I got saved. I got born again. I was a good for nothing for so many years, but I got born again. And you don't, have, you don't have to get mad anymore. That's so much more fun than getting mad. Let's keep the joy of the Lord in you because you, you are the container of the glory of God. Okay? Okay. So I, you agree with me that the glory of God is in you now. Christ in you, it's your hope of glory. But your hope will change from hope into faith and when you operate in faith by confessing what the word says is the truth, you'll become what the word says you are. You won't remain the way you've been. You're going to become what the word says you are. Right, that's with the hope of glory. And you confess what is glory. I tried, to, I tried to unveil a mystery to you this morning. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And I've, instead of me telling you that glory is up there where God is, some other location on some other planet, I explained to you that God is in his temple and that people are the temple of God. Christians are God's temple. And his, where God is, that's where his glory is. And if you can believe that, your life is going to manifest that as a wife to a husband, as a mother to their children, as a father to the children, and as a neighbor, you're going to manifest the glory of God. If you keep believing, that's what God intends for you to be. You may, you may be pretty far from it as yet, but at least you've got to start on it. Okay? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. What song fits right here? I'm not going to sing, oh, want to be wonderful there? No, we already arrived. And people are talking about heaven. It, it makes me feel so good. So I say, well, don't wait till you've got to do something else before you get there. Just start thanking Jesus that you found God. God is the, is the reason heaven is heavenly. You wouldn't want to be in heaven without God being there. God is what makes heaven heavenly. And so if the same God is in you now, you've got heavenly bliss in your life now. If you don't have it, you're not experiencing it, start pulling it apart, say, well, he's, he's your joy. Thank him for his joy. Thank him for what his word says he is in character, and you'll become that more and more. I've been doing that all my life. I confess all those things all the time. Lately, I'm confessing eternal life. And so if I'm up here uh, 25 years from now again and still looking about the same, it's because God's backing up my confession. Pastor Phil, did I say enough? Come on up here and you got it. Get me out of here. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope you got the point. The point was the mystery being revealed. Amen. 
being un unfolded. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Hallelujah. Amen. Right? I got that. So if the mansion is your heart, That's right. the size of your mansion dwelling place. is how big is your heart for God. Hallelujah. <laughs> We're going to sing the blessing over you. You know, in, in number six and verse 24, God told Moses to instruct the priests to pray a certain prayer. I usually close with it here uh, and he said when you do that he said I will put my name on the Israelites and on the people of God and uh, thank you I'll put my name